<laughs> so you're saying sell the fact. I think you're reading it the right way, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm selling the fact as a tactical trader because yeah. for me, Donald Trump in office for four years is very bullish the stock market, right? He's going to spend, spend, spend. He's going to drill, baby, drill. There's going to be inflation. There's going to be reckless fiscal spending, like Stan Druckenmiller just said. And markets have telegraphed that, right? The bond market is coming off hard. Rates are flying, right? You've got alternate currencies like gold and Bitcoin flying, sort of to me, reflecting the, the public death of fiat currency that I kind of is a vibe that I get when we flash like the US national debt number at 36 trillion and exploding. And the fact that we spend a billion and a quarter, uh, a trillion and a quarter dollars on interest expense every year here in the US. So those are the things that I think are weakening the purchasing power of fiat currency and sending gold to new all time highs like 2770 on the screen. Bitcoin to a new high for the move of 73,000. You know, Trump has obviously said that he's going to be supportive of Bitcoin and a Bitcoin payment infrastructure of some kind. I always look forward to getting a chance to talk to Tony Greer. He's the founder of TG Macro. He did it back, gosh, it's coming on eight plus years, 2016. But you got to know this guy's background because uh, I've said on all along, I read a ton of economists. I, I read, uh, you know, different analysts. But here's the combination that's key, because he created this independent research firm where he, you know, he combined 25 years in trading. That's what I think is the key. 15 years writing a daily newsletter into one platform, sort of. And you can find him at, you know, he's the editor of Morning Navigator. You can find him TG Macro on X. And he's got a new podcast called Macro Dirt. And he does it with uh, Jarrett Dillian, who's a great analyst too. It's really fun. But Tony's fun. That's why. But I, I just can't emphasize enough how important it is to have that background and how markets move. Uh, besides, you know, I'm not belittling economics, but I'm saying you've got to have that background. Tony, I really appreciate you finding time. Obviously, everybody in the analytical field is busy when you've got an election coming up in just a couple of days. That's true, Mike, but I've got all the time in the world for you, and you know that, so let's chop it up. Well, let's, let's start with the election, and I, you know, it's straightforward. You're going to have one winner. It looks like the polls are favoring uh, Donald Trump. It looks like the betting polls are, and, you know, those kinds of things. The market, you know, is. Tell us what that impact would be. If Trump wins, what are the things that you think will occur? Because last time he won, if you recall, and I know you do, but leading up to that election last time, it was, it's going to be a disaster for the markets. And I think they fell for about 45 minutes. You know, what I mean? yeah. <laughs> it really was short lived. It wasn't the day even. It was immediate reaction down and then presto, obviously onto records. Yep. Well, this year, you know, what's amazing, Mike, is that I'll never forget that election because I launched the first issue of volume one of the Morning Navigator um, the day before Election Day in 2016 with the call that Donald Trump was going to win the election and the world was about to go batshit crazy. Yeah. yeah. So that was the, that was the first good call that I made uh, in business. So that worked out OK. So now we've got another election. The markets, like you said, poly market is telegraphing a massive Trump you know, victory, it's like 65 to 35% or something like that versus Harris. Some of, the, you know, Nate Silver, some of the more reliable election predictors now have the Electoral College firmly in Trump's favor. In my opinion, the markets have begun telegraphing a Trump victory probably right at the beginning of October. And now, after this weekend of the one-two punch, if you remember, Mike, the weekend was just bookended by Trump on Joe Rogan yep. that about 35, 40 million people have watched. And then it was ended on Sunday night at Madison Square Garden with an extremely patriotic America first common sense rally at Madison Square Garden that the liberal media is trying to label a Hitler fest. Um, so that's kind of telling right there in and of itself that they're not going to give up the ghost that their candidate is still alive, um, even in the face of a campaign that seems to be publicly burning down. But so the markets, the markets have been telegraphing this a little bit since it broke in the betting markets from 50 50. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So now we're getting what I, the reason I wanted to throw in this weekend's activity was be, is because it feels like we're getting a bit of a crescendo 
of the Trump direction trades right into the election, which for me sets up as a huge sell the fact event. Yeah, that's that's it's funny. You've just taken the words out of my mouth. I said, you know, if there's uh, watching the same sort of anticipation, the market moves, several indicators. And I thought, well, that's the old buy on rumor, sell on news kind of thing. So it's interesting to hear Classic. someone with your background say that. So, so you're saying sell the fact. I think you're reading it the right way, you know, and I'm, I know I'm selling the fact as a tactical trader because yeah. for me, Donald Trump in office for four years is very bullish the stock market. Right. He's going to spend, spend, spend. He's going to drill, baby, drill. There's going to be inflation. There's going to be reckless fiscal spending, like Stan Druckenmiller just said. And markets have telegraphed that, right? The bond market is coming off hard. Rates are flying, right? You've got alternate currencies like gold and Bitcoin flying, sort of to me, reflecting the, the public death of fiat currency. That I kind of is a vibe that I get when we flash like the U.S. national debt number at 36 trillion and exploding, and the fact that we spend a billion and a quarter, uh, tr a trillion and a quarter dollars on interest expense every year here in the U.S. So those are the things that I think are weakening the purchasing power of fiat currency and sending gold to new all-time highs like 2770 on the screen. Bitcoin to a new high for the move of 73,000. You know, Trump has obviously said that he's going to be supportive of Bitcoin and a Bitcoin payment infrastructure of some kind. So those are the sort of initial macro trades that are working to me. But, you know, like I said, to be tactical about it, I think we have a situation where once it becomes clear that it's Trump in the electoral college and, and hopefully there's no tinfoil hat you know, issues with a, a clean election and a clean transfer of power, et cetera. But that's when I think the markets probably back off hard. But I think that that sell off is very steep in price, but short in duration. Mm -hmm. So I think and that we see a all panic like, oh, sell, sell, sell Trump's president. Like you just start unwinding these trades that have been winding up for a month and a half now. And then we'll find a level that I think will be into support for the S&P somewhere between I don't know, 5,400 and 5,600. And that's the dip that I really, really, really want to be set up to roll up my sleeves and buy like a lunatic if I get the chance. But there's a great example of short term and, and longer or midterm, you know what I mean, uh, differences that, that you do at uh, the Morning Navigator. You give that kind of information where you think the action is. But I really want people to hear, when you talk about this, we're talking about what's the opportunity. We're not making, I'm not making any comments on the politics of the U.S. I mean, particularly other than this is who, who is going to, that's what the markets tell me is going to win. This is what you do in response to that. But I love that it's just not a one-way trade, as you say. And I guess because I have been wondering about that, man, everybody's jumping on board here. We're creating new highs and all sorts of things. So when it happens, though, you know, my thousand-year history in markets say, you know, you, be, you better be aware that it could be a follow. But I love your also your second point, though, is, yeah, but that'll be a buying opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the other things to keep an eye on, Mike, is that, the you know, with the stocks at all time highs this time around, we've got the VIX up around 20, you mm -hmm. know, versus the last run up to the new highs where the VIX was like 12 bit at 13. Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. So it seems like right now the VIX is building in a little bit of a risk premium of the election where, you know, people are ensuring their portfolios through election volatility. And I think that that's why the VIX is a little bit more bid only right now with the S&P at all time highs. Well, the other interesting, you're talking about if there's, you know, policies, and I think they've been, you know, alluded to that Trump is going to lower tra taxes. Uh, deregulation, I think, is a huge one in certain sectors, for example. But here's the thing. He's doing it with a market with strength. I'm talking about not your short term, you know, you know, fact trade sort of, but, you know, going through a little bit, man, he's doing that in a market that's not down, you know, so it seems to be it would be rewarded. They'll create a lot of momentum coming out of there. Yeah, there's one thing that I want to note about Trump and the markets is that, you know, while he was in office, all he talked about was the stock market, mm -hmm. right? I mean, he pointed at this right. record highs, record highs, record highs. And while you wanted him to kind of stop doing it, he was right the whole time. I mean, mm -hmm. the stock market went from like 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 eighteen hundred to thirty two hundred during his uh, tenure in office. So you can't really argue with the results. But what's been really, really 
stands out like a sore thumb to me is that during this campaign, he hasn't mentioned the stock market once, you know, Mm -hmm. and I don't know if that means something, if it means that, you know, maybe he's going to take office with the idea of some kind of reorganization that isn't bullish stocks or something like that. And this very much is a sort of tail event. Yeah thought of mine you know i don't i'm not saying this is going to happen but i just think it's fairly strange that the guy that cheerleaded the stock market for four years in office hasn't said boo about it so i'm just wondering if that means anything as somebody that's sitting here at the card table playing the game you know well uh, for me it's interesting more from uh the economics point of view is you've got a huge sovereign debt problem as we just alluded to well, they can't afford a weak stock market because, of course, stock <laughs> revenues coming out of capital gains, et cetera, are just a huge, you know, it's maybe on the margin compared to tax revenue, you know, or, or I'm, I'm sorry, income tax, but it plays a huge part in sustainability. And, uh, you know, a, a roaring business community, a roaring stock market probably is the only way you mitigate the danger of that huge sovereign debt buildup. Maybe. It definitely helps, you know, it would help more to help. I think it's more important to keep your bond market together. Yeah. Right. Because that's going to be the risk of any out of control inflation is going to be a bond market dislocation lower as rates ratchet higher to reflect that inflation impulse. Right. That's the 2022 trade, right, Mike, that we had on where we were long natural resources and short tech because rates were going up. Well, let, let's stay on bonds just for a second, because I think a lot of people were surprised when you got the Fed cutting rates by a half percentage point in September. And the bond market reaction pretty darn quickly was to have higher rates. You know, I, I, I don't know many people who thought that was, you know, in the cards when they painted out the scenario for the last year that finally the Fed's going to lower rates and it's going to be the first of many, et cetera. Well, one of the simple things for me is the bond market didn't believe it. The bond markets indicating that the Fed may be set up for a little bit of a policy error, right? The Fed began their tightening, excuse me, their easing regime right at the bottom of the growth scare in terms of how the data was coming out, right? As soon, no sooner did the Fed put their 50 basis point cut on the tape, did the economic data start getting better to the point that the city economic surprises index went from minus 40 to plus 20 because every piece of data, you remember we got that crazy payroll data Yes, that was better than expected. The last one before the election shocker. Then we got better than expected retail sales. Then we got hotter than expected inflation data, you know, and the S and P at all time highs and the dollar soaring and we're, cutting interest rates <laughs> like man there's some disconnect going on there that i've got a very close eye on and it would seem to me that the fed is going to cut interest rates right back into headline inflation six percent plus wow so, yeah that's what i think is coming and uh, and again it's interesting from uh that you always have to have your time frame match with your your trades you know on that but it is fascinating to think that how wrong they've got it up to this point you know, and that's, you know, I, I think I, I appreciate how difficult it is and how many variables are involved, you know, with it. But it is fascinating to see. And man, if very few people going back just a few months said, you know, what you're saying here is that, you know, you're introducing inflation back into the equation. And uh, yeah, it'll be fascinating to see the reaction to that from the markets. Yeah, my, you know, I'm getting a little help. I'm going off of the read of, you know, Stan Druckenmiller is, mm-hmm. is a full-throated bond bear at the moment to the point that he's telling us that he's got George Soros making fun of him that his position is too small. Uh. Um, You know, so for how bearish he is, right? And you got to think that, you know, part of his bearish thesis has to do with inflation, you know, taking hold again with the Fed cutting rates with the economy, not that bad, the market on the highs, all of the inflationary instruments like Bitcoin and gold flying away. Um, You know, that's the tell for me that I'm going to kind of stick to that story until proven wrong that we're going to see some inflation and the bond market's going to have to back off significantly. When you're if you're talking to an investor and I'm not talking about like a shorter term trader and you do both. I mean, you're still going to you're going to get a little statue for calling the low in the markets in November 23, (laughs) uh, you know, November 14th. And and well, no, you know what? This is this is a results game. I mean, you're in it, you're on the front line, you've been on the front line for, you know, over a quarter century, but it's a results game. And I don't recall anyone else saying on November 14th, 
I'm loading up the wagon. You know, I'm backing up the truck and I've got a shovel. You know, obviously a great call, November 23. Uh, you know, on the longer term, it, it paid to not, you know, just to pay attention and be part of it. And I'm just thinking from a longer term perspective for an individual investor, I'm hearing sort of a similar thing after a reaction low, you know, to the Trump, you know, sell on news kind of presidency. And then for investors, I'm saying traders, you're, you're in there, you're writing the macro, you know, the morning navigator on a regular basis. <laughs> so, you know, you'll get to change or do a little nuances, but so let me just go with two questions. One for the investor, you're saying that'll be an opportunity to load up. And secondly, you're also famous for the rotation trades. You know, you're in and out of, should we be in tech? Should we be in commodities? You know, I want to get your take on where you're at with that now. So let's start with your advice to uh, longer term investors would be get, get a buy signal when you get that drop out of the Trump trade, uh, Trump presidency trade. Absolutely, Mike. So, you know, just start where you started. You know, I got I, I called for a massive equity breakout, like you recalled. And thank you very much. On November 14th, 2023, I rode that trade straight through to a thousand points, 10 months and sold it in July of this year. <laughs> and then as soon as I saw the Trump trade starting to take hold, I got back into the S&P, which was my intention all along because I'm a big believer in this bull market. Right. Yeah. I, I still think that the S&P is part of a multi-year breakout. And now that a couple of things this year, now that we've got NVIDIA you know, is leading the pack in performance and it's been consolidating for six months. Mm -hmm. Right. So and it's still leading the pack in performance. Semiconductors are still the best performing sector in the in the S&P. I think, though, you know, that's kind of a telegraph of what's going on for next year a little bit. And I think that's going to be one of the one of the follow through trades will be that, you know, we'll see continued strength in AI and a lot of the trades that are being born currently off of that. And I think those include, you know, being long uranium. You know, there was a clear response in the uranium miners when Microsoft said they're partnering with Three Mile, Three Mile Island for nuclear power for AI, you know, and then there have been two more headlines after that where Amazon is signing a contract to build small modular reactors and Google is partnering, partnering with somebody else. So it seems like this AI slash energy slash utilities trade is very real and very young in you know, in its life. So I, I like the semiconductor sector because of AI. I also like the uranium miners because of their response to, you know, restarting a lot of nuclear power. And I like utilities because they leap to, from, you know, being the totally interest rate sensitive sector of the market as a fairly high yielding sector to becoming something that is on a runaway train driven by the energy that's going to be necessary to power AI. So I think that those themes are ones that I want to stick with most closely next year. Um, but while those are tech themes that are breaking out, I still see the, a chance for commodities to rally. So I'm not really sure which way the boat is going to go. But if they're both rallying, then that could be the sign of a cyclical stock rally where you see a little bit of tech rallying. You see a little bit of cyclicals rallying. Sometimes it's the commodity sector and materials rallying, and they do a kind of baton toss of who takes the lead every day. And that's a very, very powerful sign in a bull market. So, yeah, I'm still bulled up again. I'm anticipating bull market volatility, but I've got the confidence to buy a dip in this tape because when I look in the immediate rearview mirror of the S&P, we just had that triple threat dip down to 5,200 this year where we had the yen carry unwind. We had NVIDIA backing off after the split and we had the curve steepening. Right. That's knocked the hell out of the S&P. Then we recovered to the highs and then we had the, oh, no, the Fed's about to start cutting rates sell off that pushed it back, knocked it back to around fifty five hundred. And then we went to the highs again. So when I look in the mirror, I see two super sturdy dips hold in the S&P and the general unwinding of that is the S&P propelling itself to a new high. So that's why if I get the next dip on an election, Mike, I am prepared to dig my heels in because of that outstanding performance that we just saw this year to, to how the market handled steep dips. Those dips were both 
steep in price and short in duration. That's why I think the one after the election will be too. Well, I just want to remind people too, you were at the World Outlook Conference uh, February uh, 222, and yeah. one of your big, rec- you know, gold was a big recommendation for you, but also uranium. Uh, we had a lot of, talk, you know, you had a lot of talk about uranium. And uh, I sort of sit back and I watch the declining purchasing power of currencies, including the U.S., and I sort of go, well, I'm going to own stuff. I'm not going to – I'm that simple, though. I'm that straightforward. Own stuff. My favorite stuff is uranium for many of the things that you've just alluded to. Mm-hmm. And there's not a week that goes by, and I really agree with you, those really significant moves about powering AI from Microsoft, et cetera. But, you know, it's another country that's going to add or bring back, like Japan bringing back nuclear reactors or somebody else adding to that. I mean, it really seems like that tide has turned. And yet the markets, especially for the stocks, but also for the still even uh, for the uranium price still isn't there yet. You know, uh, there's still more room on that one. But I mean, uh, let me ask you about gold a little bit, because, again, you've been bullish gold. You were, as I say, that was over two years ago. You were out. You've been writing about it before that. I'm just saying you were in person doing that. Uh, that uh, so I, I want your take on gold because then here we are at new highs. So gold to me, you know, Mike, I look at certain trades on a timetable. Yeah. You know, and we just saw gold consolidate for like three or four years around, you know, that that. 1500 to 1800 range, you know, where, where it couldn't break out of for years. And we go back down to 1600. Then we go back to the top of the range at 1800 and fail. And then we'd fail again. And we're finally clearly broken through that. So to me, gold is going to rally for three years now. Wow. Yeah. That we had a three year consolidation where it didn't go anywhere. And so now that it's broken out, it might be three years of going up. So to me, like this is just, you know, trading a bull market. You can either be super long, very long, or just a little long. <laughs> but you've, you know, with gold and the declining p- purchasing power of fiat currency, you got to at least be a little long physical goal, Mike, don't you think? I, I absolutely do. I'm wondering where, uh, does, are you looking at silver too? It's had a nice run, not as run, but I mean, I don't know. This off the top of my head looking the other day, it was up like 33%. And that's been a favorite of mine, again, for the same reasons. I appreciate it's an industrial metal. But if you are going to electrify, my gosh, you need more silver, you need more copper. That's exactly right. So a couple of thoughts on that is that, you know, the electrify trades all happened in 2020 as Mm -hmm. the Biden administration was about to get inaugurated, right? Solar stocks went to the moon and then broke down and all the EV trades and and electric car trades were working and silver was the same price that it is now. Maybe, you know, a couple of dollars lower, $30 as an ounce. Now, silver is breaking out, but to me, and I probably don't win over too many fans by saying Mm -hmm. this, Silver is a total industrial metal now, Yeah, you know, and it's because of its massive use in all of this electronic battery power and in, in, in solar panels and every application in the computer under the sun, right? So to me, it's an industrial metal. To me, I have everybody under the sun asking me a couple of months ago, hey, man, is silver ever going to catch up to gold, right? And to mm-hmm. me, that's just a signal that everybody's sitting there also long silver, Yes. Right. And I see the merit in being long the gold trade because gold is precious metal winning against the death of fiat currency. But silver is an industrial metal that's just going along for the ride. Yeah. Right. So I fear I don't I don't root against silver. I have some physical silver in my safe, but I don't have a trading position on and I don't root against the people that are long. But I fear that the risk might be that we are the boat is sentiment is as far positive as it could be in silver positioning is almost as long as it can be in silver and if gold you know if silver decides not to go along with gold on another leg up then everybody's standing around at the highs holding on a massive long silver position Mm -hmm. and that usually is a sign that a pullback is possible so i'm I'm just that's just excellent advice though excellent advice and this is exactly what people have to hear because you kind of get swept up in the moment a lot of times. I mean, that's the nature of the markets. And, you know, I appreciate it. It's a, and I know I, there's lots of people who are sort of in love with precious metals, in love with silver, and they bring silver along. But I think your point is incredibly well taken, uh, that this is an industrial metal. You have to continually factor in that. And along the same lines, uh, what do you make when you look at the charts of copper and what you hear? What do you make of copper? 
Copper to me is like dead in the water, Mike. I got excited mm-hmm. about copper into the Biden administration when all the EV trades were working yep. and it traded up to 11,000. And I thought we were going to go into a new realm of copper, you know, on the LME, copper being 10K, bit of 20K. So I guess above four, well above four bucks on the COMEX. Um, and it just never materialized and keeps failing, right? And keeps falling back into range and falling back into moving average support. So copper is kind of boring me against the the site of gold and Bitcoin and even silver rallying, you know, like there's no get up and go in the base metal markets, like there's no get up and go in the oil market right now. You know, I do have commodities on my pad as something that I, I think is okay to be long, but I'm really not, you know, thrilled with the price action of copper or oil. But, um, you know, copper's had its chance, you know, it's supposed to be part of the, you know, the electric battery power game. Yes. And we need more and more copper for all the growing economies. And it feels like maybe the economies aren't growing as fast as we hope, or they don't need as much copper as we hoped, or there's more supply, you know, than we thought. But copper, there's just not a lot of trades exciting me, Mike. You know, all, it's all in the gold trades. All the money is go, all the hot money's going into gold and Bitcoin. So I'm trying to stay in the rings where, you know, the action is, quite honestly. Well, but that last point is an important one because it's not, as you say, you don't have to be negative on it, but you can see a lot better opportunities elsewhere. And, you know, most of us have limited capital, limited investment capital. So you have to apportion it to where, you know, as you say, all of your work says, no, th- this is going to be a better bet. That's, it's not that you say, oh, I hate silver or I hate to operate. No, but this is going to be a better bet. That's all, Mike. When we're running a scoreboard here, we can't have trades sitting in dead money while other trades that were also bullish are mm-hmm. running away, right? It's my yeah. obligation to be in the ones that I'm also bullish that are actually moving, right? Otherwise, I'm doing this wrong. Well, as I say, it's an incredible time. And that's why, you know, I, I got to tell everybody here that I really enjoy the Morning Navigator newsletter. And, and also, I, I follow Tony on TG Macro and X. Uh, also, the Macro Dirt uh, podcast. And, and speaking of Jared Dillian, uh, he's pretty bullish on commodities, not necessarily today, but he's saying, don't completely forget about them. Yeah, no, he's, uh, he's definitely sniffing out a trade here that he thinks that there could be like a serious, you know, like mm-hmm. kind of a regime bottom here, you know, mm-hmm. in commodities. They've definitely been thrown out like the baby with the bathwater and kind of left for dead. There are no large, there, there, there's a bigger short position in crude oil speculatively than we've ever had, even than during the 2015 meltdown in oil, bigger than during lockdown. So the market's good in short oil. Maybe that provides a bid and things like that. So Jared's got a really good sniff and I trust him. So I'm trying to stay in this trade with him as long as I can manage the risk. But once BCOM, you know, the commodities index becomes a drag on my P&L, I throw it out the window, man. Yeah, well, let's also, I, I'm going to say this, you didn't, but I'm going to say this. I, I think one of the strengths of what you've been doing, you know, with your whole regime of, of research is making these kind of changing sectors. I mean, the record speaks for itself. Uh, you know, you've been one sector, you move out, you've, you've had an excellent record when it comes to that. So I'm, I'm just saying that that's why uh, and there's many reasons that I, I really recommend what you're doing, you know, and, and check out the Macro Dirt podcast with Jared, hear those kind of discussions going on, but check out on Twitter, TG Macro, and also the Morning Navigator, the newsletter. I mean, all sorts of great stuff, well-written, entertaining, as Tony is. Tony, thank you so much for finding time for us. Mike, you're too kind. I can't wait to see you in a couple of weeks and give you a big hug, man. That'd be great. Terrific time. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Awesome, man. Great job. Oh, you are great. You are always great.